Okay, so we're in this series of lessons from the parables, Jesus' parables. And uh, I got to tell you, throughout a lot of years of uh, being a pastor, I've, I've met people who think different things about Jesus. Right? And one of the ones that always seemed to irritate the stew out of me were the people that talked about, you know, I like Jesus, you know, he was such a good teacher, he was uh, such a, a loving person, he was so gentle. <laughs> And I thought, man, this person needs to open the Bible. <laughs> he was a terrible teacher. He wasn't kind. He wasn't nice. He wasn't gentle. Um, now that got you scared, didn't it? So anyway, uh, this parable is one that uh, has troubled me and probably everybody else for ever since Jesus decided to use it. Um, it's from Luke uh, chapter 14, verse 25. And it came at a time when his popularity was at the highest and crowds were gathering and he, you know, he should have been happy. The large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brothers and sisters, even his own life, he can't be my disciple. And if anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So where's this gentle Jesus? Uh, suppose, then there's the parable. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will you not first sit down and estimate the cost and see if you have enough money to complete it? For if the person lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him. Say, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 soldiers to oppose the coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other's still a long ways off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything that you have cannot be my disciple. Then he said, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, it uh, cannot be made salty again. It's fit neither for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown out. Now, isn't that an odd teaching, kind of a way to build the crowds? <laughs> um, what is Jesus saying? And what's he saying to us? Um, I've struggled with this one, and then some, over the years, I've gotten it wrong, okay? So if you ever heard me preach years ago, you probably thought, boy, he sure had it wrong then. I wonder what he's going to do now. Um, back when I was a really young pastor, Eileen and I uh, would go, we were called, to, I was called to be the pastor of the Protestant Church of Catalina Island. It was off Long Beach, I think. And uh, we were struggling whether to go there or not, and uh, we keep taking the boat from Long Beach, which in the old beach kind of movies, you know, it seemed like a happy cruise ship almost going over there. Actually, it's a little boat, and it is turbulent in the off the coast of L.A., and it is a, I took about a half a pack of Dramamine, you know, <laughs> going to my interview, you know, at the church to be their pastor, and I was grogged out and everything, trying to hang on as best I could till we get there. And then we come towards this beautiful harbor of Catalina. And anybody see the picture of him? It's just so beautiful. And you got the Wrigley Mansion up on the hill, that's the chewing gum folk. And, uh, and then the little town, about a mile square, and down the other side there's this huge, beautiful casino that's famous for. And, uh, and then I looked over past the casino and on the bluffs next to it, it looked like an ancient archeological ruin. I was looking at it, I thought, so I asked the, the captain, what, what's that? He said, oh, oh yeah, so there was a builder, developer from LA who came over and was gonna build waterfront condos on the bluffs and uh, got into the middle of it and uh, there were all kinds of protests and problems with permits and everything and, and eventually he ran out of money and abandoned it. <coughs> then a developer came in a couple of years later from Canada and really going to make this thing work, and they went belly up eventually and left it. And so, 
it's been a couple of years now, and the weather and everything has kind of uh, messed it up. And I looked at it and I thought, man, that reminds me of the church. <laughs> that reminds me of my life. <laughs> You know, we start out with all these good intentions, and we're going to do this, and then we get in the middle of stuff, and it all seems so rough, different than we expected, and pretty soon we just let it go. Not unlike the person Jesus is talking about in the parable. What is the cause? What's the cause? And um, I think what he's saying is, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be my disciple, it's going to be costly. And uh, it's not a short-term investment. Because God wants our whole life. We want to give God kind of a little part, the, the religious side maybe, you know. Kind of like the religion page in the, in the Seattle Times. You know, it's a little thing over there, you know, they put churchy stuff in. You know, God wants to be in the sports page, too, you know. He wants to be in the theater section. He wants to be in the front page news. Uh, he wants to be everywhere in our life and not be relegated. Now, when I look at this passage, I'd always think, you know, yeah, we've got to talk about the cost of discipleship. We've got to talk about, you know, what we've got to give up to follow Jesus. And I've preached some very passionate sermons on that theme for a long time. But today, though, I want us to look at it a little bit differently. And that is, we need to look at the cost of living. We've got to consider the cost of our, what is our lives. Because otherwise, we start out with enthusiastically and, and, we're, and we, you know, we have this relationship with with Jesus and we're going off to live our lives and what happens inevitably no that's not rhetorical actually I'm, just, I'm asking you, what times. happens tough times what? Come. what tough times come. yeah tough challenges occur for some you know like you know, for all of us it doesn't turn out the way we thought right and, and, and all of a sudden we find ourselves bearing stuff and overcome and hurting all things, and we go I didn't see that coming, and we're unprepared for it. I didn't sign up. Yeah. For this. Well, you didn't sign up for this. Yeah. <laughs> I should have thought of that. <laughs> you know, um, Friday morning, I took uh, uh, Larry and Dave Doherty to the uh, Everett Country Club to play some golf. My guests, by the way, they didn't have to pay. And. Uh, and uh, I invited along a friend for them to meet who I thought they would enjoy meeting. Uh, his name's uh, Dave Pardee, Dr. Dave Pardee. And he uh, is, uh, he was the, uh, one of the founders of the Vineyard Movement in, globally. And he and John Wimber started the, the Vineyard in, in Anaheim. Went to high school, turns out, with Larry. <laughs> Anaheim High. Larry was one year ahead of him. You know, <laughs> we're sitting there going, oh, these connections, you know. And he rides his Harley, and, and he looks all business from the front, and then the back he's got the long ponytail and everything, you know. And, uh, typical pastor. And uh, and we were talking, and we said we were talking about the the days of the you, you young folk don't know this, you know, the, the Jesus people, and there was a big revival in Southern California, and really all over the country, and great music, and hundreds of people being baptized in the ocean and all this stuff was going on. And we started talking about what happened to them. What happened to those people who were so excited to follow Jesus? And he, he said that uh, sociologists have now have a uh, name, a descriptive name for those who uh, came through that movement and, uh, and now where they are in their lives. And it's called none. None. These are the none people. Life kind of took over and took them sideways, and now you ask them what their faith is, and they go, none. And what church you go to? None. What's your relationship with God like now? Well, I've got none. They're the none people. And we were talking about that at the table and went, how is it that, that with full sincerity, we can um, 
begin this adventure of following Jesus and, and we mean it and, and we're living it and everything and then somewhere along the line something snaps and, and we stall out on the way. And I think Jesus is talking to the crowds as the crowds are growing. He's going, wait a minute. This is exciting now and you're all wanting to jump on board, but you need to count the cost, the cost of living. And what does it mean? Because a little Jesus in our lives can be very dangerous. Okay, I'm just telling you that. I've spent my life with people who just want a little Jesus, you know, in moderation. Um, they don't want to get too radical. They don't want to get too, you know, believery. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to get too enthusiastic. They just want a little Jesus in, in moderation because that'll help make them kind of nice people over the church where they can do business deals and stuff and everybody can get along great and their families will be nice and they can go to the Christian school if they want and, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. And that's very dangerous. Why? It's because, yeah, well, it's not deep at all, but the thing is, a little Jesus helps us to feel comfortable. It helps us feel like our life is going along pretty good, right? It helps us feel like we can handle what happens, because we've got Jesus with us as we go along. Kind of like the butler in the old movies, you know, where you ring that cord, and the butler shows up and says, uh, you rang? And, uh, well, maybe that was the other or <laughs> she <does work. laughs> uh, you get the idea. But, but the, the butler's there out of sight, out of mind, until you have a need, and then they're there to meet your need, and then disappear again. That's how we treat God. And I think Jesus wants us to know a little bit of Jesus is not going to do it, and um, we're going to be overwhelmed by life. And he wants our whole life. He wants a total commitment. And, and uh, remember, uh, uh, elsewhere in the Bible, it says, uh, um, I better, better quote it, you better not just, um, what is okay with it? Something, put first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Mm -hmm. Right? Seek ye first, that's the word I couldn't get. <laughs> Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added. If we seek first all these other things, and when we get all these things together, then we'll have a little Jesus in there. <clears throat> Doesn't work. And you know what? God knows that. That's why it says, put me first. And then you, you'll be able to go through life. You'll be, able to, you'll be able to get through life and, and you'll be able to handle the ups and downs and the problems. Because when we have a little bit of Jesus and we're comfortable, we think the problems are for those people. Those people. They have those problems. We just kind of escape by. But then we don't. And we become those people. And I, I made a few notes here. Let me share them. Okay, so here's what happens in life. If we get into situations where we start to care, inevitably our hearts are going to break. It's going to happen. If we uh, choose to get involved with people, with situations, with things we want to help, we want to get involved, we will, I can promise you this, we will be disappointed along the way. And if we, uh, you know, open, if we're open to love, that means that we're also going to be open to hurt. If we choose to trust people, we'll be let down. Okay? If we believe people, will know betrayal. I think that's the cost of living. Mm -hmm. That is the cost of living. And so, no little bit of Jesus is going to help. No little bit of Jesus is going to get us through this life that we're, that we're in. We need 
We need a great Savior. We need a, a great Lord. We need, we need Lord of our life. And anything less than that is not gonna, is not gonna work. We, we need a great Lord who promises to be with us always, even to the end, who's gonna be with us when we're in these life realities, right? <laughs> We need a great Savior who the Bible describes as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Because if you've ever been in a time of grief, you know that you don't need somebody to put on a happy face with you. You want somebody who understands, walks with you through that, right? We need his wisdom, we need his love, we need his presence, we need his power. And for everything that we have had to face, that we're still carrying with us, and for everything that we will face, I think that's why Jesus said the enemy of uh, the opposite of discipleship is um, and wholeness. That was, okay, Jesus didn't say that. I said, I'm saying this, okay, so this is my idea. If, if the opposite of uh, faith is not doubt, but it's control, right? Mm -hmm. We've talked about that. The opposite of faith is control. The opposite of wholeness, the opposite of wholeness is having a divided life. I could segment things off. Um, most of you are too young to remember uh, the phrase. Um, down in, in South Africa, there was a thing called apartheid. You don't, you've never heard of that because you're young and youthful, like. And uh, but I'm old, so I remember apartheid, uh, in which there was a country divided, uh, and uh, it worked well for some people didn't work so well for others. And I thought, we have apartheid spirituality in our lives. We divide things up. And, and, as, and we have our money issues over here. And then we have our, our job issues. And then we have our relationship issues. And we have our family issues. And then and we have our, our spiritual issues. And then we have something, you know, we've got all these things that we, that we have going around us. And, and with a divided life, we, we become segmented. And Jesus wants to make us whole. He, wa he wants to, as the center of our life, he wants to pull everything together in, into a wholeness. And, and we miss out on that. A, a quote here from you. A German uh, theologian, I know you read German theologians all the time, you know, you probably found this already, uh, Helmut Tillichy. Uh, At first sight, Jesus seems harsh and implacable, he says. But it's only the sternness of a physician who tells a person that only a radical operation will help you. If I do not cut deeply enough into the flesh now, I shall only be doing a superficial and temporary patch job. And in a few weeks, the disease will break out again in fresh growth. So, this is Tillich saying this. So by his very radicality, isn't that a good word? His very radicality, Jesus' intention was to free us from this confounded dividedness. He says, if you want to follow me, and if you set any real value on what discipleship gives to you, then you must also make a radical change in your life. Then you must say goodbye to many things to which you cling. If you do not, you will only be a person who's been scratched by Christianity and is constantly chafing your bruises. Then you might better have remained a tough pagan. Jesus wants no halfway Christian 
He wants a person hot or cold, but never lukewarm. Are we going to be people who have been scratched by Christianity and it irritates the stew out of us throughout our life? Or are we going to let God do something radical in us? Take over everything. Be Lord of our lives. Uh, this, um, this week, um, I think it was Friday, it was a Friday afternoon, I think. I had to get home, right? Yeah, Friday afternoon. I was doing a radio interview in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And... Uh, uh, the ride home with John and Kathy. It was 5.15 there. It was 2.15 here. So anyway, it was a traffic hour thing, you know. And so uh, on the ride home, and they were going to interview me about the book. Uh, you know, I didn't sign up for this. And so we're having our regular interview. The, the publicist sends them little questions to ask. You know, they didn't send me the questions. But, but anyway, little dinky questions to talk about on the radio. And right in the middle of the interview, Kathy, the co-host, veers off script and goes, what do you do about this crazy world? <laughs> this craziness all around us. This, uh, what's going on? And, and people, we don't know who to trust anymore. And we don't know who to believe in anymore. And, and, and uh, we thought things would be a certain way. And now it's, it's just crazy. What do we do? <laughs> Go to commercial. <laughs> you know, I stalled. I said, I said to her, this is a, a trick, you know, that uh, people do in their interviews. I go, you know, Kathy, that's a really good question. I'm so glad you asked it. Because that gives you, you know, about 20 seconds to start trying to think of something. <laughs> What do we do about this crazy world where we can't trust people? We don't know what's going on and everything, blah, 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 and discipline and shock. And I thought, really? Really? What do we do about it? First of all, don't trust people. You'd be an idiot to trust people. Don't believe people. You'd be an idiot to believe people. You're setting yourself up for heartbreak right there. Don't trust them, don't believe them. And she's going, oh yeah. <laughs> and, and I go, you know, like we've talked about a hundred times here. The Bible calls us to trust God and love people. And we go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm going to trust people if not love God. No! You trust God every day. You don't trust people. You don't believe. You believe in God. You don't believe in people. And you love the people. Whether they're crazy or not. Whether they're hurtful or not. Whether they're letting you down or not. You've got to find a way to love through it. And guess what we find out is the process. We don't have to be good at that. We don't have to be good at loving people. Because here's the deal. Jesus will love them through you. It's his problem. All we have to do is be open and stay engaged. And he'll find a way to love the people through us. And we can trust him for that. <coughs> What's the cost of living? Everything. What's the cost of discipleship? Everything. And you're welcome to try and live your life with a little bit of Jesus on the side, like a Cajun seasoning, you know. <laughs> or you can seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other stuff will be added. It's your choice. The oh, Lord. You know our hearts, you know our needs, you know our situations, you even know our futures. You know our past. And so we ask that you would uh, come into us for the first time, for the hundredth time. Be Lord of our life. Be a great Savior. And some of us have clung to a little bit of Jesus. Lord, overpower us with your grace. Surprise us with your love and joy. 
and give us the courage to trust you and continue to love people. That's our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.